This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Well, first off, Stanley, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, maybe state for the record, what's your uh, your expertise on coronavirus? Uh, well, I've, I've been studying coronaviruses uh, for 38 years. So uh, I've worked with mouse coronaviruses, human coronaviruses, and this new uh, human coronavirus. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology and pediatric infectious diseases at the University of Iowa. And uh, why were you studying it 38 years ago? Wasn't it just the common cold 38 years ago? That's in humans. But in mice, it actually caused a disease that resembled the human disease multiple sclerosis. So I was interested in that. And it turned out to be uh, not just a uh, mouse disease, because what it was is the virus caused an immunopathological disease. So you got disease when the immune system started to respond to the virus. And the same thing may be happening with uh, this new coronavirus, as well as with SARS and MERS. So, so uh, what is that? What do you think is ha- so? So we'll start with this, but then I want to kind of pull it back to where we are now. But what what could be happening with this coronavirus that's related to what you've seen earlier? Well, if if you always have disease when the immune response is clearing the virus, is getting rid of the virus, then that means that your uh, what you want to do in terms of therapy is not only uh, clear the virus, but you want to tone down the host immune response so you don't end up with severe disease. And how do you do that? Not easily. I mean, that's that's one of the things that people have been working on because we don't know which parts of the host immune response are causing the problem. And if you work, if you do it too well, then you may allow the virus to grow more than it uh, would otherwise. So it's a tricky business. It's just that more right now. It's something we think about. And people are trying to do things, but nobody's figured out exactly how to do it. Well, and what do you mean by? Uh, I'm trying to understand because it's a little bit in the weeds. Like, what do you mean by doing? Um something too well. What, what? Well, for example, in 2003, people used corticosteroids uh, to treat SARS. They tried to uh, decrease the amount of virus with a drug called ribavirin and then come back with corticosteroids to tone down the immune response. The idea is you get rid of the virus and you tone down the immune response, patients will do better. The problem is ribavirin had no effect on the virus, so it continued to replicate. And the corticosteroids suppress the patient, like corticosteroids always do, and viral patients did more poor, did worse than if they hadn't had any therapy. Okay, so let's. Well, I'm just curious. Let's take a, a a step back. I feel like there are a lot of known unknowns and some unknown unknowns. Uh, you know, the the newspapers keep repeating, and even in the White House press conference, you know, an established reporter. Uh, repeated this number, the two percent fatality rate, and I feel like that's kind of the the critical number that's being overused. And then we could guide, dive in deeper into other questions. But what what? How do we start determining the fatality rate? Is there a fatality rate that's known? What's your guess? You know, because I think that determines how serious this is versus prior outbreaks of coronaviruses or or mutated flus or whatever. Yeah, I think it's a, an important point. Uh, we th- I think that the number right now is 2 to 3%. I think the numerator is probably correct, the number of people who died from the infection. There may be some people who are where death is attributed to something else, and maybe the coronavirus has a role. Because uh, certainly in China, they haven't used, they haven't diagnosed everybody who has it. They didn't have enough resources to do that. So I think that the numerator is pretty good. The denominator, though, may be way off, because there may be a lot of people who have mild disease who are not being diagnosed. So, in fact, that 2% make it down to, uh, I don't know, uh, something under 1%. Right. And, like, right now, the, the, so the denominator are the number of cases we know about. But yeah. we don't know about cases where someone got infected but never had symptoms and simply got over it the way someone might get over a mild cold or, or even less. So is there any... Given, given also that it's hard to test this, and maybe there's no accurate test, has there been any study to attempt to quantify how many people get serious symptoms versus no symptoms out of the uh, universe of infected? Because then we'll start to understand how many infected there are. No, you can't do that yet because you have to test a lot more people. In Wuhan, they were testing lots of people, but there were probably lots more people who they didn't test. So you just have to do enough tests. And uh, probably in the U.S. and other countries, in the West, this information become available because they're doing 
much more screening in the sense that somebody, for example, if somebody in the U.S. has a uh, is known to be infected with the virus, they then go back to all the contacts of that person, and now you can can begin to get a sense for how many people have mild disease relative to this one person who presented with presumably more severe disease. But we don't have those data yet. If if you were right, so we don't have this data. So 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 all we know is uh, serious uh, symptoms. Uh, or, or all we know is number of deaths divided by number of people with serious symptoms. And that turns out to be the, the 2%. But if we don't know the full universe infected, it could be that the case, the, the number of infected with mild to no symptoms could be 99% of those infected, or it could be 1% of those infected. We Do we have any, I mean, South Korea has done some testing over, you know, larger groups. What's What's your gut given any of the recent data you've seen? Yeah, so my gut is that it's near one percent. That it's going to come out to one percent or less. Um, the the recent so out of those, the only part of what you just said that I don't quite agree with is that out of that uh, denominator, it's not just people with severe illness; it's people who have mild illness who are tested because they have to be. So the so it's not a completely just twenty uh, percent of the population being tested. We just don't know how big that group of subclinical and mild infections is yet. But there's, there's, there's hints coming out that it's going to be nearer to 1%. 1% is still high. If you have a huge number of people infected, uh, 1% is a lot of deaths. So I hope it's even lower than that. Uh, what Do you think there's, given that the direction is, seems to be that it's going lower, do you think it could go much lower than 1%, like one-tenth of 1%? One-tenth of 1% is at the lower end of seasonal flu. I think this is probably going to be more severe than that. So seasonal flu is considered to be one in a 1,000 to two to three in a thousand, I think that, which is 0.1%. Uh, and I think, so I think I would guess this won't go lower than 0.3 to 0.5%, uh, but that's totally a guess. Right. What about, what about immunity? Do you think it's the, I know there's been some cases where people are discharged and they get it again, but maybe they were discharged too early. What, what do you think this is, there's immunity to this? Yeah, I think that this is this is something I've been thinking about because I think there's five or six cases I know of like this now, and um, I don't know what's going on. I it sounds like the patients are discharged when they're well, so first they should develop some immunity. It'd be amazing if they develop nothing. So I don't understand uh, what the recrudescence is. I, I don't know from those reports if infectious virus was actually isolated. I can't remember. There's the one paper in uh, JAMA is best for that. And I don't remember what it showed. Um, so you want to make sure virus itself comes back as opposed to viral RNA, which is what we detect with the usual screening assay, the RT-PCR assay. And that's an important distinction because if you have viral RNA but not virus, you're not contagious. So you need to have virus there. So I, I'm not sure I understand. So so in these cases, um, you know, so immunity is a big issue because that's the way viruses like this go away. We could get a vaccine or the society develops herd immunity and the virus doesn't simply Absolutely. doesn't come back. Yeah. And so things like SARS and even the flu have immunity. And the, the reason people get the flu again is because it mutates and this is a mutated, perhaps a mutated SARS, we don't know. But so explain that again. So someone's discharged and they seem well. Uh, what What's the, why, why again, I don't understand why that some of them appear to be getting it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know the answer to that. All I'm saying is that there's two or three scenarios. One is that they get reinfected with the new version, with the second time again, which would be a surprise because they should have some immunity to it. Uh, the virus recrudescing, in other words, being inside the person then coming back out again, uh, would mean that it didn't fully go away, as you alluded in the first part of your question. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. And, and the third thing that I said is we think that uh, the virus seems to be recrudescing, but I, I just wonder if we're picking up uh, products of the virus rather than the virus itself, because we don't measure infectious virus. That's hard to do, except in high biosafety areas. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So, so what does that mean? Does that mean they might have elements of the RNA of the virus, but they actually don't have the virus? They're not contagious. They're just being picked up by a test because uh, it's sort of like the the garbage of the virus is left over in their body, but it's not really active. Yeah, and that's only part of the story because people are sick on the second time around. So it's not just the garbage. So I don't understand it. I don't have a good answer uh, for this because it, it would surprise me if there's no immunity. It would surprise me if the virus was hanging around so long. All the, all the possible explanations are not something I expect from a coronavirus. So that's why uh, I don't know why this is occurring. And it, it's really amazing to me that it is occurring. 
Have uh, you ever seen a coronavirus uh, with no uh, immunity? Uh, no. No, I've seen immunity wane quickly, but not in two weeks or three weeks. I've seen, we have cases of people who have MERS coronavirus and then several months later have no antibody to it. Uh, but not, not two weeks later or not three weeks later. So, you know, the other possibility is they never developed an antibody. That the, whatever their infection was, it was so light that they never actually developed a good immune response. And so, but then again, the virus, should, if they did that, the virus should have uh, never recrudesced. It should have gone, been gone because the host, the body never saw it. But, so I'm waffling because I don't know. I think it's very curious and we need to know how many more cases like this occurs and, and uh, what is going on because I don't think we know. Could it be that uh, they weren't through with the incubation period, but they tested positive, they were put in the hospital, then they were let go somehow and, and it didn't show up in a test I don't know, maybe, maybe when there's no symptoms, the, the testing is not as accurate, and then they kind of fully developed it after they were released? Yeah, yeah, that's possible. If the test missed, missed the, said that they were negative and they never were, then that's a possibility. That's another scenario or version of one of the scenarios that I mentioned. So, but then it's a very prolonged infection, um, so, which is possible because SARS and MERS could go on for, for people with sick. They could have evidence of virus, not, not necessarily infectious virus, but these products for weeks. So maybe that's what's going on. You know, maybe we're detecting people so early that we're uh, doing something we didn't do with MERS or SARS, and we're seeing more of the natural course of how this infection proceeds. That's a right. possibility. So, so maybe if we're detecting it so early, but perhaps uh, the, the, the detection's not accurate. So some, it's so early, sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. We let somebody go, and then the full virus comes out. Uh, that's, right. that's a possibility. Yep. Yeah. And, and what, what, and then there's been some question about seasonality, although this seems less accurate just because there is warm weather in South Korea and other places where the, the virus exists right now. Do you think there's some seasonality component? There could well be. We don't, again, we don't really know. A lot of these viruses like dry and uh, cool weather. Uh, certainly places like Hong Kong don't have too much dry and cool weather and the virus seems to do fine there. Uh, southern China, the same thing. So it's certainly a possibility that in a temperate area like the U.S. that uh, whatever we have will uh, slowly recede over the next month or two as we get warmer weather. Uh, the, of course, the concern is that it'll come back in the fall uh, when the weather starts getting cooler and drier again. Do you think the fall is enough time for us to create a vaccine or a cure? A cure, probably not. Uh, curing, both those things have issues because um, curing I don't know what that means in the sense that a lot of the uh, therapies that people want to use, you have to give very early in the infection. So if most people have mild disease, you might not give it to them. So then the people get severe disease. By the time they have severe disease, nothing may work uh, because all the damage that's been started, just like I was starting to tell you about with the mouse virus, if you start having damage, then you're not going to reverse the damage by getting rid of the virus. And that's been shown experimentally in animals. So the therapy may be tricky. In terms of vaccines, yes, there may be vaccine candidates who may have things that get an immune response. But as we were just talking about, we uh, better make sure we understand exactly how the immune response works and um, what you need to protect people because you can get an antibody response. But why are these patients relapsing? Or are they not getting an antibody response in the first two weeks? Uh, what about the antibody response isn't protective? Um, so it's all, I don't think we know yet exactly what we need. We, we have guesses from other coronaviruses and other infections, but um, that's still an area that uh, needs investigation. Well, well, it, it seems like, I, said, I don't want to say this is a mutated common cold, but the common cold is, or types of the common cold are a form of coronavirus. And we always say there's no cure for the common cold. So it kind of makes sense. There's not a real easy cure or vaccine for this. With the common cold, we tend to treat symptoms. So- right. It could be the case that maybe the only approach or the best approach is simply taking uh, treating symptoms once you realize you have it. Yeah, that's that's right. And I think developing a vaccine, if this turns it, because this is a more severe infection, uh, if we can get a vaccine that gives some sort of protection for at least a few months to a year, maybe by then the uh, uh, virus, if it comes back, will come back only once and then will be uh, protected long term. That's the other thing about vaccines, along the same idea of if this is something that you want to protect for the next 10 years, then we want a vaccine that, uh, that initiates long-lasting immunity. And that's another thing that we don't have yet. Because we don't even have it for the common cold. 
We well, don't common, have it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Common cold is even worse because uh, there were um, studies in the 1960s to show if you took volunteers who had some of the common cold coronaviruses and they had antibody to the common cold, you could infect them with the virus and they'd get a fine common cold again. So it didn't even work. So, so what are the best ways to treat the symptoms? Uh, this one, the kind of the usual things that people do. If you have mild symptoms, you want to stay hydrated. Um, you probably eating isn't the key thing, staying hydrated and uh, resting. Um, and then if you get sicker, going to the hospital, at least calling a physician, finding out what you can do, uh, keeping your, the air around you moist. Um, but then seeking medical attention if it looks like you're uh, going the wrong way. I mean, it's the same things with a common cold. It's uh, you stay stay away, stay out of public. Um, if you're at home, protect the people who are living with you from you. Um, those are the kinds of obvious things like that. Wash your hands all the time. Have them does, wash does, their hands. Does Tylenol work? Uh, Tylenol will make you feel better. Um, ibuprofen will make you feel better too. I don't know. Ibuprofen cuts into the inflammatory response, and I don't know if that's good or bad. It might be good. Uh, so those things. I don't, I don't think we have really information that they make things better or worse. So uh, Tylenol certainly is something I think would be very acceptable uh, to use without worrying too much about any un unexpected consequences of using it. With the ibu with the NSAIDs or the ibuprofen like drugs, it's sometimes a little iffy. But I, I think if I felt really poorly, I probably would use them as well. What about something like Tamiflu or anything like that? Zero help. Zero. Okay, because that's mostly the flu. It's a different family. The other, the other number it seems we don't know is how many, how many of the exposed get infected. Yep, we don't know that. It's, it's uh, what we know is that this virus is more contagious than a lot of other viruses, but we never know that number. We never know, even if it has what's called the R naught or R zero of three. We don't know about the other ten people who you might have been around. You know, the infection is what well, the way it works is you have it's large droplets, so the person who's infected. Uh, spreads the droplets. They usually drop to the ground within a three to six foot radius. Uh, who, who in that radius, if there's five people, how many of them actually get it on the hands or something that they then touch their face and become infected? So it's very. That would be a wonderful number to know, but we don't. We don't know. Right, because you know, the the I, I, all I'm trying to say is like I don't I don't want to be an optimist or a pessimist here. I'm just trying to be a realist, and I see I've seen. In major newspapers, the the two percent fatality rate reported, and an assumption that seven billion people are going to get infected, which means one hundred forty million deaths. But then, if you look at there's the ratio of the exposed versus infected, which we don't know, and then and we don't actually know the fatality rate because we don't know the percentage of mild mm -hmm. coronavirus versus symptoms enough to qualify as oh, this is this person has a disease. All we know really is the number of deaths. We don't know. We don't like you said. We don't know the denominator. It could be eighty thousand, like they're saying now, or it could already be ten million. In which case, it's a much smaller Absolutely. number. Absolutely. So, so you know, and uh, you know, one thing is, do you, do you think? I guess related to this is, do you think containment or quarantining is working? Well, I think that people think um, certainly it worked in the SARS epidemic. It really worked well there when you had a limited number of individuals and you basically separated them from the population make sure they didn't infect anyone in their household. In this case, we have quarantining of a whole city or a whole province. Um, and it seemed, people think that it did some good in preventing a huge widespread infection. But I frankly don't know, because in the end, there was enough cases in Shanghai and uh, Guangzhou and Beijing so that you don't need any more people from Wuhan going there, uh, to, at least in China. Certainly in the U.S., the fewer people who, who are admitted uh, who come from Wuhan and are infected, uh, the less likely there are to be nidices of infection. Uh, but quarantining in general um, only works if you've caught all the people uh, who are infected and you've sequestered them early enough. Um, otherwise, it have, may have some effect. But if you're looking for quantitations, no, no, not we don't know how much it helped. And the, and the reason this is an important question is, is you know, right now in Wuhan and in large parts of China. All the factories are closed. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And so it's only I, my guess is uh, just from what I'm seeing in in the market. An, let's say another four to six weeks of this. That's a real serious effect on the world economy. Like we, it turns out coincidentally, we were dependent on the Hubei province for almost all of the world's goods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's shut down. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you completely there. So we don't really know. Uh, we don't know the effects of the quarantining. We certainly know that there are the negative effects. And then it's amazing the number of metal healthcare workers who went into uh, uh, Hubei province, even though they knew they might not be able to leave. So I think really our hat should be off to them because they, yeah. they make huge contributions. So, but all the things you're saying are true. It's just, you know, it's so hard to, and even in retrospect, I don't know if we're going to know what the right thing to do was um, because it's so, this is moving so quickly and it's so, um, so unexpected. So out of, out of 3000 deaths, give or take, I don't know the exact number, uh, only all, all of the deaths except for about a hundred have occurred in China. Is that because it started there and that we haven't had time yet to see the deaths here? Or is there something about, you know, there's been different reports about Asians having a certain kind of receptor for the disease that makes it more likely for them to get it or get it seriously. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know anything about the latter, about uh, there being a genetic difference. Um, if I was going to pick on something, uh, and I don't think it, I don't know if it's going to hold up, but there's a lot more smoking in China, and whether that weakens your lungs and makes you more susceptible, that's certainly a possibility. It has never been proven, but it's a possibility that uh, that's that's the fact. That's a factor. Uh, the other possibility is that when we get to the U.S., when the, the uh, Europe or the U.S. starts seeing the infection, there's going to be uh, because there's fewer cases, they're going to be jumped on earlier. They're going to be given better uh, symptomatic management in hospitals, and uh, there'll be a higher, uh, there'll be a lower mortality rate. So right well, now, I, well, do we know if lower, uh, if if they don't have symptoms, do we know if it, if they're contagious? Uh, well, I would think from everything I've seen so far that if you have zero symptoms, I'm not sure you're contagious. I know there's hints of people saying that. But I think it, well, the way most diseases like flu or measles are contagious is just when you're starting the infection, you're in the prodromal stage. So you don't really know you have it. You feel have a scratchy throat. You don't feel right. Cough, start coughing a little bit. That's when you have the most virus. So there could certainly be people like that. And those people could then go on to get mild disease, but they may have infected other people while they were on the way to getting mild disease. I guess it makes sense because apparently this is transmitted. It's not airborne, but it's transmitted through droplets. So... You when you when you have symptoms and you're coughing, that's when you're spreading droplets around to the people around you. As opposed to when you have no symptoms, unless you're, you know, spitting at somebody, you're probably not going to infect them. That's what I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are you? What, what's your gut on this right now? In what sense? In in the sense that, you know, again, the the, the most extreme reports are ridiculous, which is, you know, 7 billion people are going to get exposed, which might be true g given how contagious it is. But then what's, 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 how's this going to play out? Clearly 140 million people are not going to die. It's horrible if 10 million people die. Hopefully it's much, much less, but the panic is such also that every country is getting shut down. The quarantining is so extreme, particularly in China where all the uh, goods are being made. I mean, in an ideal scenario, in a few weeks, it starts to die down when the warmer weather hits, you know, the northern hemisphere, and uh, uh, we start to see this thing fade out the way SARS did. Right. Yeah, and that's that would be my gut feeling as to what's going to happen. I don't think we're going to have 140 million deaths. I think we're going to control it way better than those numbers say. I think that number is that two percent, two to three percent is going to creep way down. Um, but on the other side, I don't think we can be. Uh, cavalier about it and say, oh, well, we know that's going to happen, so we shouldn't pay too much attention. So I think the panic factor is bad. Uh, we want to minimize that. Uh, in Iowa City, I know that they ran out of rice in Costco uh, because uh, God knows why. Um, but uh, so you want to, you want to, I, what I like to think is that people should balance uh, keeping their everyday life with being more uh, observant, you know, washing your hands, seeing who's coughing around you. If you're coughing, pay attention to it. Uh, watch if you're touching, if you're in an airplane and you're going to the bathroom, uh, wash your hands after you touch the door. All these things that are the sort of common sense things, but we don't think about because it's it, we have to be much more conscious of our surroundings than we normally are. Have you seen a pandemic like let's say H1N1 in you know swine flu in 2010 or whatever it was? Uh, were there similar numbers in the beginning there? Because I remember there was a lot of widespread panic, although it subsided very quickly. 
Yeah, so that was different because I think it's different because in Mexico there was a high mortality rate, and then as the virus spread, we saw that it was really like seasonal flu; it was much lower. So it, it'll that, and we're too early to know if that's the way it's going to pan out. Uh, but that one was clearly we were picking up the tip of the iceberg, and then when we got the whole iceberg, it wasn't as bad as we thought. This one feels a little different because uh, there's so much concentration in China, and there's such a huge number of people in Mexico. The, that one, this H1N1 as much as anything, was getting more patients. But we have plenty of infected patients in China, and the number there seems to be at 2 to 3% for what we have. We just think we're missing a lot of the patients. So it feels like it's more severe than that. Although, although when you say the tip of the iceberg, it could be, uh, again, the same thing here, just because we don't know the full number. We don't, yeah. Like if it's, there's 58 million people in, in the, the province that Wuhan is in, for all we know, the entire 58 million people have been either exposed or infected. Right, exactly. Yeah, so that's that's why it's the best thing is to, for us to be as calm as we can and uh, be measured in what we do and be, and you know, the other thing that people should do is they should uh, plan in their heads and not do anything, but things like, let's say the, the U.S. had started becoming more severe. Well, for people who work, it means that they may have to work from home. Children who go to school may have to stay at home. There's things you have to put in your equation I know my friends in China are not sending their children to school. They haven't been in school since, I don't know, when December, which is driving the children crazy. But uh, but that's what, that's the kind of thing you have to uh, put in your equation. But, is, you that know, all, is, that, is that all over China or just like Wuhan and Shanghai and, and places like that? Or do you, do you think 100% of China is, is, is being affected like that? Probably not 100%, but um, I know big cities outside of Wuhan are being inf- affected like that. Let me see. Um... I mean, I guess, what's, when do you think we'll start, like, what will be the first signs, the, the first actual concrete signs that this isn't as bad as the full spread panic is suggesting it is? I think that'll occur. I don't, uh, I think we, with any luck, with the, the number of cases in China may be receding. Uh, my friends in China tell me that. I don't know if it's accurate or not. Uh, but that would certainly be the first step that things are being contained. Because, in fact, if they're contained in China, it uh, would mean that even though Wuhan, Wuhan was hit very hard that and Hubei province was hit, that the other areas like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou and uh, other big cities were able to contain it. So that would be the first hint that we're on the right track. Um, although and, so. although, although uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence that we can't trust the Chinese numbers. There's been there's – been, and these are – I believe these are total rumors – but that the crematoriums are being overworked, you know, and again, people will make up anything. It's hard to tell at that level who's just making up stories, who's scared, you know, what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I talked, what I do is I tend to talk to my colleagues in China who I trust. So, but what you say is still true because they only, they only know the information that they've heard. So it's very hard to know. I don't think that, no, I just don't know. I don't want to comment on rumors one way or the other. So, but I, I haven't heard from my friends that there's crematoriums that are overwhelmed with dead people. And then, and then, is there any way, given U.S. or European data, that we can start to see? Oh, this is not. This is starting to die down. This is not as bad as we thought. Like, what what would be indications there? Oh, I think then if you start having countries, you know, open countries like Italy has a certain number of cases, and then over the next week, those number of cases don't increase much or the cases in the U.S. don't increase much. That's the kind of data you're looking for. Patient, uh, places that are really very careful and very open, and you can see exactly how things are going. And, uh, and go ahead. Oh, oh there's, there's some countries where it seems like people are getting it without exposure to anyone from China, like in Iran. Is yep. that, do you think they had some exposure or? This is the same thing's true in the U.S. There's gonna be plenty of people here who don't have an obvious exposure to Italy or Iran, and, or Italy or Iran or China. And we'll still get sick because this is a contagious disease. As we've discussed, if you have mild illness, you might still be contagious. So you could be two or three or four away from a source that you don't even know you were near. Right. And then, and then how long does it live on a surface? So if someone with coronavirus spits on a doorknob or, or rubs their nose, sneezes and holds a doorknob, how long does it stay on the doorknob where I could be uh, infected? Yeah, so the last part is the part I don't know. It, it hangs. People can culture virus uh, two to five days after it hangs on a doorknob, but whether how much is infectious after the first uh, 24 hours or two days, I don't know. In theory, you have live virus, though, uh, for several days. So it's a, it's a concern. 
And and when do you get actually scared? When will you be scared? Oh, if I will be scared, or I don't think I'll ever be scared because I live in Iowa City, but um, I will be I will be very concerned when I start seeing cases increasing exponentially. In uh, in, in like the U.S. or yes, yes, because it has been cre- increasing exponent with an R not of you know meaning every person infects like two or three people. Well, uh, that's going to uh, result in exponential increase, right? Uh, unless, unless what? Unless if we don't, if quarantining doesn't work, eventually the entire world will be exposed. Right. Exactly. So, and I, so I don't think that'll happen, but you know, that's certainly one worst case scenario. So this, the reason I don't, you know, the, as you were very appropriately saying, the the whole problem with doing these worst case scenarios is they sound so awful that you almost can't relate to them. I mean, they yeah. just. So it doesn't really help. And I think that at the individual level, people should take risks, you know, do what they can to minimize their getting infection and minimize infecting other people. And uh, uh, listening to what public health authorities say, assuming that they say reasonable things. But um, that's all you can do right now and not go crazy because in a way you have to be a little bit fatalistic about it. Uh, you have to just carry on and uh, not not be so negative that, uh, you end up uh, making things worse for yourself and for other people around you. And I guess a valid test, which would maybe, I don't know if this would make you feel better, but a valid test would be able to d- determine in a random population how many are infected with no symptoms versus how many are, you know, you know, what's the percentage of all the people infected who actually have symptoms enough that they get sick? Because again, if that's 10%, then the fatality rate goes from 2% to 0.2%. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's the kind of numbers we need. And are there any tests that you know of that are happening like that? Like, do you think we'll get those numbers anytime soon? Well, we I don't know. It's because the other part is the uh, sensitivity. So if you have a very mild infection, you don't make an antibody response, then you have to catch the person just when they have virus uh, on their mouth or nose. So it's real hard. So like, is, it, is yeah. there an accurate test for which part? For the, just in general, corona, like you know, this, this coronavirus. Yeah, it is an accurate test, but you have to catch it when you have coronavirus around. Those patients we just we were early talking about who had mild disease and they got worse disease, uh, those patients, you, it's clearly the test is working well. We're talking about people who have mild disease and then don't get anything more. And you have to catch them just when they have mild disease. And it has to be enough disease so, so that you test them because you're not going to go and test all 330 million people in the U.S. Yeah, and, and how do I know? Like, let's say I have a cough. A lot of people have a cough for many reasons. They have a dry throat, they have the cold, they have a sore throat. Nobody's going to say, oh my gosh, I have a mild cough. I think I have coronavirus. Like you're not going to really say that you have coronavirus until you're over the deep end with it. Like it's a hard disease to say it's other than our normal experience. Right. Exactly. So that makes it harder for me. Like if I have a cold, I'm not going to allow myself to be quarantined right away unless it's serious. I, I think that will never happen. Yeah, and until recently, you couldn't even get tested. So I think the, the rules are changing a little bit. But, but if you have no exposure to anyone, you have less likelihood. I have, I think anyone who has the disease, you have less likelihood of actually having it, so you won't be tested. So these are all things that are uh, we need to know and we don't know yet. Well, uh, you know, Dr. Perlman, Dr. Stanley Perlman, uh, University, is it University of Iowa? Yes. Uh, uh, Thank you so much for taking the time. Is it okay if in a few weeks I call you to get uh, a further update? Yes, I will be in Iowa City. I won't be traveling. Yeah, I actually am going to be in Amsterdam in a week and then Austin. I'm afraid I'm traveling too much, but uh, hopefully it's uh, I'm going to sit close to the window on a plane. I hear that's the the, the right technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, somebody's coughing. Move, move away from them. But medications for preventative or other things you're looking out for, other statistics? Yeah, so you just cut out for a while. The, the Skype froze, so I didn't hear what you said. Oh, is there any other numbers I should be asking about? Like, are there any statistics? I sh- my main concern is the actual number of infected, because then you know the denominator, and then you can figure out the fatality rate, and then you know how serious this is. But also, I'm curious if it spreads further beyond Asia. The deaths don't seem to be yeah, spreading yeah. further beyond Asia. Yeah, yeah, those are actually key questions. We don't know the answers yet, but that's exactly right. And the immunity question, we don't quite know the answer. The seasonality, we don't really know anything. But but we do know the 2% fatality rate is probably not accurate. Yeah, well, that's what it is now, but it may, it's likely to change. Yes.
All right, Do Dr. Stanley Perlman, thanks so much for the update, and uh, I will talk to you soon. I really appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. Take care. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So, Dr. Eric Ding, uh, virus virologist, coronavirus specialist, you want to maybe, uh, yeah. well, first off, welcome to the show, and maybe describe your background a little bit. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I want to clarify, I'm, I'm not a virologist. Um, so I'm a, I'm a general epidemiologist. Um, I've been at the Harvard School of Public Health for over 15 years. Um, and, you know, I think this public health emergency of international concern, as the WHO calls it, has grown just beyond uh, just a small epidemic to something that literally will affect very much everyone's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and I'm very concerned about how it's spreading, not just around the world, but also how it's impacting our local communities. So yeah. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to be here. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's very interesting because it's the, the impact is a little bit in due, of course, a lot in due to the, the virus and a little bit due to the messaging about the virus, which is, I hope mm -hmm. we can contribute a little mm -hmm. to sort of help people figure out the signal versus, versus the noise. Um, just, I guess, I guess just from, from your perspective uh, and your research into this, what, what, do you, what do you think people don't know right now that they think they know? Hmm. Well, first of all, I think, you know, there's uh, lots of bad comparisons towards the flu because, yes, the flu ha has been around and uh, makes a lot of people sick and ill, but I think our people are kind of ignoring the fact that we have partial immunity of flu and we have a flu shot a vaccine that works most of the time. And But for this, it's a brand new virus. No one has any um, background historical immunity. And there's no vaccine, and it spreads faster than flu, and it seems to have 10 times um, the mortality, uh, at least, than the flu, if not 15 times a higher mortality rate. So altogether, there's a lot of different reasons why this is worse, worse than the flu, even though it has not spread as far yet to date. Um, and there's lots of, uh, lots of tricky things where there's asymptomatic transmission. And that means, you know, during the incubation period between when you're exposed and infected and when you develop symptoms, previously, like for SARS, you didn't really, you weren't really contagious during that asymptomatic period when the virus is growing in your body. But for this virus, it seems it is. And that makes containment so much trickier and worse um, because previously we conquered SARS, by the way, 17 years ago without the use of any vaccine vaccination. Uh, the vaccine didn't arrive until we actually stamped it out. Um, because back then, you know, if you took a plane and you got off the plane two days later and got sick, they could quarantine you, but then they didn't have to tra backtrace everyone on the plane when you were still pretty healthy and symptomless. But with this virus, it really kind of becomes tricky because even when you had no symptoms, it could have been transmitted to everyone else. Well, can I, can I ask you about that, uh, doctor? Yeah. Can I ask you? So it seems like this is transmitted, from what I've read, it, it seems like it's transmitted through droplets, meaning right. if someone has it and they cough or sneeze on yeah. someone uh, that they're close to, that mm. person could then, is then exposed to it and could then get the disease and so right. on. Right. Although so if you, I would if, say not, not just cough or sneeze, but, you know, general every, everyday talking. If you ever had dinner with someone, you're talking all across the table, the droplets that come in your mouth when you're talking can infect um, someone else, even without coughing or sneezing. Right. So, so, but if they're totally asymptomatic, um, and they're and they don't have those droplets that are sort of carrying the the disease on them, will they? Is there a potential for it to to transmit? If they're truly asymptomatic, maybe there's this kind of gray area in between having yeah. minor symptoms and asymptomatic. Right. Right. Um, and that's the thing. It might because again, having symptoms is is a is only after your entire incubation period passes, which, by the way, is this completely separate issue of how long is the incubation period, and that actually affects whether the 14-day quarantine is enough. But even if you're, say, still perfectly healthy, you've been infected but have not developed symptoms yet and went to dinner with someone and laughing at a party 
ha ha ha, you know, and spraying some saliva around when you're talking, you could still pass it theoretically, because that is what we've seen in multiple studies. There's been over four, maybe five studies now in major you know, newspapers um, and, and actual j- j- medical journals like JAMA to actually show asymptomatic transmission. So this is, this is really tricky and makes containment so much harder. And, you know, for example, the best example is, you know, the Japanese quarantine officer goes on the cruise ship that's docked off the coast of Yokohama. He goes there with a suit, with, inf- with protection. He gets off a couple hours later after the inspection, contracts COVID-19. And same with a firefighter who was transporting these cruise ship passengers. Um, he was protected. He still contracted it, even when they knew of all the dangers and protected themselves. There's something about this that um, maybe it sticks on like surfaces that it's even after you, for example, open the door or, you know, have a droplet on a table, somehow it can still transmit even after um, potentially several hours or several days, you know, depending on temperature, humidity and disinfection. But that was what makes containment so much tricky. And this is why, like, even, you know, quarantine officers are getting it. Right. So, so, well, it, this, this brings up the interesting question, which is, you know, we don't know how many people are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Like if I had a cough, I wouldn't automatically assume I have coronavirus. And, you know, people are quoting this number of, you know, there's this many cases, there's this many deaths. So it looks like a, a fatality rate is 2%. Yeah. You can't Given calculate we, it. Right. It's, it's tricky. This math, the math around it is tricky. Because first of all, there's underdiagnosis. Like, you know, as we know in the U.S., there's been a big hiccup with and delay in the testing. And even in China, they're estimating there's 10x, if not even more, underdiagnosis because mild, mild cases are just being turned away or just not being detected at all. And um, again, mild cases are still, you know, even if there's no symptoms, you can still shed viruses and keeps the epidemic um, potentially going and outside of the outside of china they are assuming 3x under diagnosis so eight if you know that's denominator if you add more denominator then more mortality drops but at the same time you know in terms of recovered there's a like more than half the patients in china still has not resolved because to calculate mortality you have to like basically number of deaths divide by total assuming everyone else has resolved and recovered but half of them have not because the mild cases are around two weeks long, according to WHO, and severe cases are around three to six weeks long. And, um, and by the way, which is this is very long. So two weeks for mild and three to six weeks for severe uh, is incredibly taxing to the healthcare system. Like um, the China, there's they're using very high, like two thirds of severe cases are are using ventilators, and some of them are using ventilators for four weeks. It's it's really uh, um, severe. So all and all that in terms of mortality means there's a lag because until uh, all the case fully resolves, some of them could still die. And that's why the the crude calculation just based on total diagnosis cases and total deaths at the current moment is, is um, it's a tug of war between underdiagnosis that drags the number down as well as, um, yeah, you know, these, the disease lag that actually could make the number go higher. So this is why the ballpark is between one to three percent mortality. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. And and what I'm wondering is what's the and and I'm not trying to be uh, an optimist, but I'm just tr- exploring what what the range of possibilities are. Like, mm-hmm. what's the possibility that the number of infected could be much much higher than we can possibly imagine, just mm-hmm. because most of the cases are either asymptomatic or a mild cough and they cure themselves and they never get noticed. And obviously, mm-hmm. we haven't tested most people. So let's yeah. just take like the Hubei pro- province in China, for instance, there's 60 million people, maybe 78,000 uh, mm-hmm. known infected cases, but those are the people who show up at the hospital. What's the chance that it could be millions and millions of people that are actually infected, but just a, you know, asymptomatic or low symptomatic right now? Yeah. And that is, that is a high chance. Um, and that's why there, we think there's 10 X under diagnosis. You just take the number of cases and multiply it by 10 um, of true number of cases. So that is possible, and there are a lot of mild cases in which people have almost no symptoms. They have a small cough or small 
little sneeze here and there, and that's it. And oftentimes people don't go to the doctor for that kind of stuff. But the problem is they could still transmit. The problem is they could still transmit, and and unless you stop the transmission cycle, it's tricky. And this is why, um, you know, they've done a study of say supposedly 100 infected people got on an airplane for 12 hours. Uh, this is a study by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. How many of those people are we going to likely be able to find? They said we'll likely only be able to find like, you know, 10 to 20 percent of them. Most of them will actually escape detection and will continue to spread. And right, right. So, so are, is that 100 infected or 100 exposed? Uh, 100 infected, like exposed as in they got infected. Um, okay. So, so yeah, that's a study from three weeks ago. We, we've actually learned eons more since that three weeks and in many ways for the worse. So I would say, you know, I think I think it's much worse than we think because – Let's just take Iran. Someone did a modeling of this. The fact that you saw um, two initial cases, both being deaths in Iran, that means we're seeing the tip of the iceberg finally coming above the water, right? right. It's like a volcano or under a sea volcano that's finally boiling over the top. Um, and so someone modeled it. Uh, basically, uh, two cases immediately and the number of exports they have is probably estimated 18,000 cases in Iran with a confidence interval of 95% of 3,000, 50,000. And lo and behold, in the last few weeks, Iran, all, like everyone and their mom uh, somehow has one in their family, including the vice president and the deputy health minister of Iran that both have it as well. Okay. And, they're not, and they're not quarantined as well. And so it's just tip of the iceberg. Same with Washington State. We finally resumed testing. Finally, after we sorted out all this uh, faulty CDC test, test kit delay issues, they started testing the last two days, and boom, immediately they found a death yesterday. And that means, remember, severe cases are three to six weeks long. The fact that we had a death already upon the first day of testing means, again, it's kind of like Iran. We're literally at the tip of the iceberg, and there's potentially hundreds, if not thousands more cases that's circulating. And um, there's another study that just came out yesterday. Um, they actually analyzed the genomic sequence of Washington case. and it's actually linked with the Washington case from over a month ago, the first case in the U.S. But these two people do have do not know each other, have no contact with each other, which means this same virus strain. This you know, it's not from California or any cruise ship. This same virus strain has been floating around Washington State for over a month, unchecked. Right. That's so scary. That 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 is scary. But there's I uh, what I'm trying to understand is given that. It does suggest again that the infection rate might be much higher than we realize, yeah. and then and if you if the infection rate is underdiagnosed by 10x, could that reduce the 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 known fatality rate from yes. the, the reported two percent to zero point two percent, which is around flu levels? Theoretically, yes, but again, there's there's two factors in this flu mortality. The underdiagnosis, um, if that is only true if among all the cases diagnosed anywhere. Like take Korea. Korea has the best kind of thing. Assuming no one dies, no no one else dies, and the deaths that you have, everyone else resolves to full recovery, and the deaths you have is all you have, and then you with the under diagnosis divided by ten, yes, theoretically that's the number. But that is making a whole assumption that no one else of the entire infected pool dies, and no one else gets infected. So it's like you think of a cohort, you know, this as you go through this cohort of disease progression, you know, people will die off. And just because they haven't died yet doesn't mean they, they, there's no there's zero risk for them dying. And so that number always bumps it up. So if no one dies, absolutely. Yes, you could divide by 10 in China, theoretically. Um, but that's not the reality. Um, so. My actually, what I'm actually really curious is South Korea because South Korea has the most comprehensive drive-through. You seen the drive-through testing uh, pictures? It's amazing. They literally they do two updates a day, and between 9 a.m. 4 p.m. they have 10,000 tests, uh, lab tests run. And you know, South Korea is the size of population of California, Oregon, and Washington, and they literally go through 10,000 tests just in between the lunch break between 9 and 4 p.m. I, they're doing like the full Monty in terms of the testing. 
And I really am I'm curious, you know, how what is the mortality like with this full comprehensive testing? Right. So from, from what I understand, it seems like the Korea testing is when we're first going to get a much more reliable sense of what the true fatality rate is, and yeah. number of infections, and so on. When do you think we'll we'll get reliable numbers on the Korean data? Well, given that, that might change the entire message yeah, around it, the world. It could. Right, it could. I would say, first of all, remember, WHO says short case, mild cases are two weeks. Severe cases take three to six weeks to resolve, right? So there's a lot of people who've been in hospitals for like four weeks, over a month. Um, so I would say we would have to wait probably, you have to wait for this entire current cohort to resolve. I would take, that would say like take six weeks and add a little data, you know, analysis time. It might take, you know, eight weeks before we know for sure. Um, assuming again, there's no, not much underdiagnosis. We could, we could do also serology. Um, serology, you know, is basically instead of testing directly, or the PCR tests currently do a molecular test of the virus particle presence directly. It's a direct test. But serology is eventually people will develop antibodies. And then, you know, they could, even after they clear the virus, they'll still have the antibody, you know, the, the uh, humoral, memory immunity, just like you've had a virus before, and the next time you see it, you're going to be less sick or not sick at all. So these antibodies will float around your body for several months, and we can actually get a good sense of how many total people were exposed, um, and which would get at this underdiagnosis. But I think Korea is a really good example, but I want to remind you something. How There are a crap ton of people who are on ventilators. China can build hospitals, or even if they're field hospitals, in 10 days. And they ha- can manufacture a huge volume of ventilators and huge staff and move, uh, you know, tens of thousands of healthcare workers from across the country to work here on these ventilators because they're basically mini ICUs. I don't think America has any hospital. You try to get admitted to a hospital these days, it's almost impossible. America does not have the hospital beds, ICUs, or the number of ventilators and staff to, to staff those ventilator ICU units. And so the mortality is wholly dependent on how aggressively you have these machines. Because right now in China, even on ICU, 50% of people who enter the ICU on ventilators die within 28 days, 5-0%. So, but is that going to be true in Africa, Brazil? I'm not sure. America, right. where we have such terrible uh, healthcare system, I'm not sure. So, so, so it's interesting. So. Okay, so just to unpack that, in Korea, the testing that they're doing, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get the full picture once this cohort sort of rides through the life cycle of the disease. So call it yeah. six weeks, eight weeks to, uh, you know, after you analyze data right. and so on. And that might give some indication about how, you know, what the real fatality rate is, and that may right. or may not calm people down. But you bring up an interesting point, which, oh, oh then just to add to that, in, in when 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 the whole life cycle of of this year or whatever goes by, you will use serology. Just like with H1N1 in in 2010, we're able to use serology to see, hey, how many people just in general have these antibodies lying around? Could be millions for all we know, which is what yeah. we discovered then. And mm-hmm. the fatality rate was almost was minimal. It was almost inconsequential. Uh, but you bring up this other interesting point, which is even we're not going to really know the fatality rate because the fatality rate may go up in the U S just because we're not prepared the way China might yeah. be prepared. And right. so that's a danger now. Uh, uh, but this leads to the question of can containment work or as the head of the CDC said, everybody will eventually get exposed. I, uh, I'm going to give you two answers. Containment can work on certain pockets. Um, but I think long term, there will be many, many outbreak pockets in the United States. I'm not saying like if you're in rural Montana or rural Arkansas, you, you're going to get it. But depending on if you live in a major city, go to lots of concerts and go to a lot of political rallies and other kind of you know, social events, there's a high chance you might get it. So, you know, absolute containment throughout the United States, no, but maybe some localized containment where, you know, it does not enter rural Montana. Um, but, I, but I think the cornerstone of, of public health containment, until we have a vaccine, which will take a year, or these, finishing these uh, 
uh, antiviral drug trials. A lot of these um, drugs uh, were invented for HIV or Hep C. And so they already exist. They're, they're phase one done. We just need to do a, a, another phase two for this viral COVID endpoint, which will take a couple months. Uh, we might get some preliminary results. And so that ramp up will be faster. But until these main countermeasures, the antiviral drugs and the vaccine, that hopefully is high effectiveness, because not every vaccine has 100% effectiveness. Um, like the flu vaccine this year is only 48% effective because of the, the wrong strain. We, until those countermeasures come in, the key thing is testing, 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 contact tracing, isolation, quarantine. That is, and of course, social distancing uh, generically. But, but without testing, you're literally in the dark. You're driving on a highway with no headlights at midnight. And that is what a lot of what the United States is, has, have been going through. And finally, when they clear the roadblock, whoa, we found a whole bunch of them really fast, right? And, and the other thing is, you know, unlike in other countries where testing Korea is just like giving out free testing, right? And many other countries have universal healthcare systems. Right now, people, you know, they have to pay co-pay, co-insurance, see a doctor, potentially pay to be hospitalized, isolated. You know, if someone ran up a $4,000 bill just or a $2,000 bill just to get tested. And um, if that's the strain, no one's going to get tested. No one gets tested, the epidemic even worse. Yes, sorry, go ahead. So I was saying, like, think of you like a, a, you know, a bartender or an hourly worker. And basically, if you get tested, you're basically quarantining off. Is Not every employer is like as generous as Facebook and will give free unlimited sick leave. They will, are they going to dock you pay? Are you going to get paid while um, being quarantined? Are you going to be forced to use your vacation days? All these are disincentives for people to go get tested. And I think that is a real existential risk that people don't want to get tested. So let, let's say let's say there is. Well, first off, how far away do you think from we are from a cheap home test? There, there, there has been some people who say claim that they discovered it uh, or developed it, like um, like a one hour test, like a rapid test. Um, there's, but FDA still has to do a EUA emergency use authorization for it. And that, uh, and I'm not an expert on that, so it might take a while to apply for an EUA. And the other key thing is the reason that CDC process is slow is you could test, like a testing off for the PCR is you have a primer, a probe that will, it's, it's like a, it's like a, think of like a Velcro. It hunts for a piece of the COVID coronavirus, right? And you can find it, you can f- develop a primer that can search and scan for it. And then, you know, the PCR machine amplifies it and you get a positive test. But sometimes it will have cross reactivity to other coronaviruses or other, say, an old SARS virus or other common cold. So, yes, you could develop a test that, is, um, that finds the, your virus, but you have to also develop it so that it's specific enough that it doesn't get a positive for other viruses. And that is the quality control measure where they have to see, well, yes, you proved you can find the COVID virus, but you have to prove that when you find it, you don't test positive for any of the other viruses that are floating around because it's cold and flu season. There's plenty of those. And so that is that process of, you know, validating it and all the negative controls to prove that it's accurate enough and sensitive enough and specific enough to this virus. All that, um, you know, is more than just, uh, you know, development it also has called regulatory approval and that's why it takes time but it's important does that make sense yes absolutely so so uh on the vaccine stuff there's some indications i don't know this is all just rumors like you hear stories here and there uh is there immunity to this it seems like there's a couple cases where people get out of the hospital and then they get it again but my yeah. guess is these people just were uh, not correctly released from the hospital yeah, yeah. So there's two room. There's a rumor of like a reinfection or some biphasic thing. I don't think those are. I don't think it's a reinfection. It's just it's it's you had cleared it in some parts of your body, but then it flares back up. Um, just like HIV, you know, HIV could be uh, eventually suppressed by these HIV cocktail drugs to below limit of detection, but you're not clear. You still have HIV. Um, and so this virus, you know, it's not the same as HIV, but it's the, the key is that 
sometimes in certain body parts, um, some body fluids, it could be less than the limit of detection. And right now, China's algorithm for uh, releasing someone is three days, no fever, I think, um, and then no, sim- no more symptoms and test negative on the lab test for two consecutive days and, and th- before they release them. But again, the testing is not perfect because we found a lot of people who test negative five or six times and that then test positive. The test is only 50% accurate according to the Chinese Academy of Science for their own test. Um, and similarly, you know, uh, you can miss it on two, t- like for example, Washington state, um, the new England journal first report back in January on that first case, he had tested positive on his nasal swaps every day, but his mouth swaps, they were kind of, some days they were positive, some days they were negative, even though he, he clearly had it. Um, and you know, and some urine and, and, and fecal sometimes are positive. So there, it depends on how it's swabbed. There seems to be some sort of differential um, testing depending on where body part and day-to-day variation. Some days it was positive in the mouth, some days it was not, even though he clearly still had it if you swab his nose. This is where this is where it's worrisome, right? Because the test, you, you, have, you can have the best test in the world, but if your body, you know, you it's suppressed for a few days because you're healthy, but then, you know, if you if you're sleep deprived, if you're immunocompromised, and then the virus can flare back up, you've never cl- fully cleared it from your body. And that is what we, that is maybe what happened. Because supposedly the first Washington case, he's recovered, I think. And uh, did he, was it, did he still transmit or or did he transmit before he had recovered and uh, to someone else? And, and it was basically this mystery uh, community transmission that eventually led to this more recent case yesterday. I don't know. Um, but, 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 so, the, but the flip side of all that is that um, it, it does suggest that immunity, because all this boils down to will a vaccine work or not. And if, if the mm-hmm. testing is, you, the more incorrect the testing is, Given these these stories of people getting infected, the more likely it is that a vaccine can can work. Um, I think in terms of a vaccine, vaccine is basically okay. So testing is trying to find out like this. It's a signal thing, right? Like uh, whether it's a signal in different body fluids or is the signal specific enough. That's where the testing. The, like if the vaccine is to train your body, the purpose of a vaccine is to train your body to recognize this virus. With a, with an atten- either a, a, a dead one or a live attenuated version that is kind of harmless, a harmless version, but wears the same outer coat as this real virus. And, um, and so that you recognize it and next time you develop antibodies for it and you train it to recognize. It, and then when the real virus comes, you're protected from it. And you're, as because your antibodies will immediately re- recognize it and recruit immune system to attack and destroy it. That is a very different uh, issue, and um, you know you can be it can go into your body, but you you will mount an immune re- re- uh, re- reaction that's so fast that it will put it out and nip it in the butt uh, once you're infected. So a vaccine can still work; it has no uh, you know relationship to the testing necessarily per se in this context. Uh, unless the testing has been inaccurate um, in terms of. Correctly diagnosing the um, if a person's over the disease, I, th- I think that's what's happening is that yeah. people are incorrectly saying, "Oh, I, we're at, we're done with the disease." And then they, I am concerned. Still yeah, I am concerned. I am concerned about this whether a recover when they trying to release if someone has recovered whether they're truly recovered based on just two negative tests. Right. Because fifty percent positive, that's not a that's a pretty high failure rate, uh, you know. So. Fifty uh, percent accuracy. I mean, it's it is a concern, and we, that's why CDC tried really hard to find a test that is super specific and super sensitive, and that takes more time than oftentimes an epidemic can allow. So, so I think. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I think you know, I think uh, getting the test first out there, I think because a positive signal right now for the most part is very positive if you have someone with cold or flu or pneumonia. So I think an imperfect test right now is is still the best way to go. But to truly release someone as recovered, I think we have to use a, a much more sensitive test. So now, what, like, at what point do you think 
um, everybody in America is at risk in terms of walking down the street, going in the subway, going in a store, and so on. If we have community transmission, this is why I don't know. We don't know what we don't know. But this is why it's really key to do the testing and find out, you know, how widespread it is. Because, right. you know, if you do um, if you do a lot of these tests, and it's most critically among people with symptoms, because you don't want to test every single random person normally. Um, and because this, the positive predictive value will drop. Uh, and there's a complicated math I can go into. But basically, you want to test people with some high likelihood of having it, such as people with flu symptoms. Um, I think I think if we see community transmission in your area, assuming sufficient number of tests to do a sampling, it's kind of like a census, right? Um, then, uh, then I'd be concerned. Right now, what the CDC does, uh, what they're planning to do again now that the testing is resumed and they fixed the, their little lab error, was they have all these flu labs, public health flu labs, like 40 of them. There's also nine, uh, 50 additional ones that they can cooperate with. And they're originally in these 40 flu labs, they were going to um, test basically every flu negative sample. So basically, if it's, uh, they have the Sentinel surveillance system, which they test all these flu samples from across the country in these labs. And this is how we estimate the flu prevalence because we don't test everyone because there's huge underdiagnosis. And anything that tests negative for flu, they test for this new COVID coronavirus. And um, that's that's going to, once that ramps up next week, I think we're going to get a good sense of how many tests, how many samples, how many of the people with flu are actually COVID versus traditional flu. Right. And, and, and even that won't tell you, though, how many people have this COVID, but are just asymptomatic. And again, both these exactly. things make the fatality rate much exactly. lower. Exactly. Because asymptomatic mild um, are not necessarily fatal, but A, they could develop or, or B, they could transmit to someone who is, has immuno, you know, problems or respiratory. Because most of the deaths are people with respiratory problems initially. But then again, look, there's several doctors, 29 years old, 29 years old, 34, 39, 42 year old doctors who are in their prime who died. And that's really worrisome. So I don't think it's just those who are super sick. And in the Lancet uh, paper, you know, half the people who were in the ICU were actually under the age of, of, of 60. So, now, hey, but, but here's a question related to that, like and particularly even with the, the, the doctors in China who have, who have died from this, how many, you know, 52% of men in China smoke. And I wonder if this is related to smoking at all in terms of the, the fatality. <laughs> Yeah, it's possible. It is possible. Uh, although they a, b their doctors and c a lot of these young doctors who died were actually female doctors too. So not all of them were men. Um, so yeah, I do see that smoking definitely exacerbates it, and maybe China mortality because most of our mortality estimates come from China. Maybe because uh, every everything else is pretty low other than Iran. Maybe China has higher mortality because of this greater susceptibility. But again, there are young female doctors who died. Yeah, I mean, I was reading one statistic that it's men seem to be either getting it or dying from it at three and a half X the rate of women. And I wonder if that was related to the smoking. Yeah, I don't know if it's three and a half X. It's maybe like 50 percent higher okay. in this one paper. Um, but yeah, it's it's could it could be because smoking in China is just like what? 60, 70 percent of men smoke. It's 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 ridiculous. Um, it's possible. This is why I want to see, you know, China's underdiagnosis. Also, China currently, they're, they, I'm not going to say cook the books, but they kind of like suppress it a little because they don't count lab positive cases with no symptoms. If they somehow catch an asymptomatic, they, they don't count you. So their official right. numbers only include the symptomatic lab positives. Which right, hence terrible. the higher fatality rate. Yeah, so I really want to see what's happening in Korea, Japan, Singapore. Hong Kong and other super hyper uh, disease surveillance uh, locations where there's an outbreak. And, and again, it'll take about in terms of the current testing in Korea, which it, we have to wait the six weeks for the full uh, cohort to, to, for the d d disease to pass through one way or the other. The people have been tested, and then another couple yeah. of weeks to analyze. What's yeah. the chance do you think this doesn't become epidemic in America? Oh, you're asking that what's the chance it doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the, what's the chance of not having an O-ring failure at launch for 
subtle yeah. challenge there, I guess. Uh, um, I think the question is, are, will there be, what's the chance of zero epidemic outbreaks? First of all, I kind of already think there's an epidemic in Washington state. The evidence, two lines of evidence are already suggesting that. California as well. So, so I think maybe I can rephrase the question. What's the chance that this won't be localized? What's the chance it will be almost like in multiple, multiple cities and states across the country? I think right now there's like less than 5% chance that the U.S. will be spared in that way. Um, I think it's 95% confident that it will be many, many states and there will be many, many states and cities with community transmission not related to travel. Unless let me and and this leads to the next question, which is some people are suggesting some seasonality to it, or that it won't be as vigorous. Right. The R not might go down as you know the weather gets a little better and and so on. And of course, South Korea and Hong Kong have good temperatures, and it's not stopping the disease. But yeah. I don't know. Yeah, um, you know Singapore. I just want to point out Singapore first of all. Singapore. When the epidemic happened, it's 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit in Singapore right now. Um, and they still had a really bad uh, epidemic, albeit it's, it seems to be as died down now. But but the epidemic, for example, in Singapore, you know, in the in nice warm weather, was in a hotel. It was a super spreading event at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Singapore. And it was that Singapore business traveler who went to the French Alps and infected a lot of people in France. And then... Um, went to UK and then went to Mallorca. So, A, I think the temperature doesn't necessarily matter, especially in our modern world where we're inside in buildings and hotels and um, and these super spreading events don't, we're not outside dwellers anymore, right? So it can be super warm outside, but, you know, air conditioned hotel temperature can still allow even these super spreading events to still occur. Um, so that's why I'm not super confident. And then there's something called the Southern Northern Hemisphere, you know, seasons change. Yes. But then you have another cold season, you know, in the Southern half of, of Earth. And so I think it's going to come back long story short. And it, unless we get it in control, unless we have a super good high efficacy vaccine, it could become endemic as in it just comes back year after year like the flu. So. This is why I'm really hopeful that we don't just have, uh, uh, you know, 60, 70% effective vaccine. We need something much higher because, look, uh, you know, a 50% vaccine is is not going to contain this epidemic because the R not reproductive number is just, you know, um, for every infected person, the R not says that it will infect two to four additional people depending on the situation. Um, and that number is much higher than the seasonal flu of 1.3. And you know, even if it's double, if not triple, um, you need you need a vaccine that is highly, highly effective, way above 75 percent. I would say 80, 90 percent or more. Um, and even if we fast track, you know, all the current research right now, and the FDA stays out of the way, what's the chance that we can have something like by September, by the next cool weather? Uh, you know, I think antiviral drugs, maybe, because we might get some antiviral uh, drug trial uh, results by the end of April, early May, right? Um, if they're successful, if they're wildly successful, somehow, sometimes they'll stop the trial early and it's like, oh my God, we got to start using this. You know, we can't, you know, there's a, there's a DSMB, Data Safety Monitoring Board of Trials. There's an ethical thing where, A, you can't be too dangerous, but if it's super beneficial, you can't continue the trial either. So if it's if the DSMB says, oh my God, the trial results are so amazing so far, we need to stop it early and just start giving it to everyone, we might see it maybe by this summer. Um, but on the normal schedule, um, it will it will be at least six to nine months. Um, uh, maybe maybe we can get results in late April. I'm hopeful. So so. When you said you said something interesting earlier, which is that in Singapore it basically died down. What does what does that mean? And that what 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 can we learn from that? And how does that affect how we're viewing it here in the U.S.? Yeah, Singapore obviously has universal health care, universal testing. Um, so the U.S. has neither of those. Um, Singapore has enormous amount of wealth. They gave every single um, 
resident masks, and I think the high quality N95 ones too. Not, um, and uh, it's, it has world class hospitals. It has, you know, really, really good sanitation and the quarantine management system. It is, it is literally the world class epitome of healthcare and resources that you can dump from this high, enormously wealthy uh, city, state, country into their population. So they basically stopped the community spread. There's almost no community spread anymore. Um, and uh, more, I think more than half the people have recovered already. Um, and, you know, the, the, the six-week timer window hasn't even finished yet. So I think Singapore is probably going to be one of the best examples. But can we go with Singapore mortality numbers and infection control numbers as the gold standard? I don't know because Singapore is Singapore. Uh, you know, Niger- Nigeria has a case. Brazil has a case. You know, Italy's health, public health infrastructure is, is not that is not like Germany, uh, nor Norway or Sweden. So I don't think we can't translate every single country's examples into for comparison. And especially the U.S. has the worst situation of having non-universal health care, which means, you know, patients will be afraid of testing the cost of testing, the cost of treatment, and the cost of being forced to be quarantined and, you know, furloughed from work without I wonder. Pay. I wonder if from a policy perspective, there could be money allocated for, you know, free testing and, you know, yeah. you know, pro- benefits if you, if on treatment and so on. Yeah. This is, this is the thing we're trying to work through because a lot of corporate uh, companies are asking about this and I'm working on a, on a policy memo with, with a colleague, but, but there's different options. Like, a, um, you know, there's basically some, there's some businesses that offer short-term disability, right? You know, say workman's comp. Can workman's comp short-term disability um, be part of this? Um, I don't know. And it's short-term disability. And, you know, can, can they just offer just paid leave i don't know if every small business can right um especially if if like half your company ha- it has to be basically quarantined um there's and medicare medicaid so medicare has created a new code for this diagnostic and as well as a new icd 10 uh number for this disease so they're they're ready to co- they're ready for coding and billing in terms of that sense the question is can can Medicaid just offer it as a free billing for, you know, like a, a special eligibility? Normally you have to qualify for Medicaid, right? But what if they just made a exemption that regardless of your qualification, anyone can bill this Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare code for treatment and diagnostic. Um, and then it will be covered. I, I, I don't, I, it might, it will take definitely executive action and maybe Congress to authorize that. So, so it's interesting because it, it, let's let's even take the best case scenarios in every way. So the fatality rate is much lower than we think. There's some seasonality, so it'll start to go away eventually. Let's even say public policy adjusts magically uh, to to handle a lot of this stuff. Then there's the other issue, which is uh, China has you know half the country's quarantined, factories are closed down, yeah. and maybe the economy has weeks to go before we start seeing bankruptcies uh, bigger than than normal and unemployment and so on. I wonder if the situation is going to start, like China's already saying cases are subsiding, but of course we can't trust that many, much, we can't trust many of the numbers in China. And so I I don't know how we avoid the other worst case scenario, which is that the panic causes the economy to crash. Right. It's possible. And and this is where, how, you know, a lot of the economy right now is, stock market especially it's, it's a matter of psychology right um right now people are having costco runs because they're panicking right especially in the west coast uh, states right now because there's the epidemic um and then because of the panic buying are they going to basically bunker in if they bunker in and not shop and uh it might reduce the marginal propensity to consume you know in terms of the ec- economic uh, equations or in macro economics yeah and then that's going to if you reduce the marginal propensity to consume. Basically, p- people are just frozen. They're not going to just like China right now. No one bought cars. Like cars is almost like 
unrelated to anything with the virus other than, you know, some minor transport here and there. But people just froze and stopped buying cars because park cars is one of those things where there's high elasticity, right? Um, if there's a money crunch, people just stop buying cars. But, you know, certain things like bread and milk, there's low elasticity. Even in a recession, people are still going to buy it. So I think you have to look at price for elasticity things. Those the most elastic kind of luxury products and, and you know, casual and non-essential products will have the steepest crash early on. It's if there's full panic and full concern about this epidemic and full lockdowns. Start, you know, because I think schools, when schools start locking down, then parents, a lot of the parents who can't work from home may have to be forced to stop working. Like productivity can slow down in many ways, separate of sales driven productivity, right? And, that, and that's in China. I mean, I'm worried about the companies here that uh, exactly. depend on Chinese inputs. Yeah, exactly. And I, uh, there's already, there was also, um, you know, I was actually talking about a lot of things here in the States too, but. I think in terms of supply chains, you know, Apple, you've already read that yes. Apple is highly dependent on those kind of supply chains. But pharmaceutical drugs are already facing shortages. One drug is, <clears throat> FDA is not releasing, but FDA has put out a warning. One drug has, there's a shortage because their supply chain has been interrupted from China. But they've identified 20 additional drugs that have very, very sensitive to the supply chains from China that could be at risk of shortages as well. Um, and again, a lot of other imports that we require for our auto parts. Um, close. You know, yeah, close. A lot of things that rely on these kind of, you know, China ramping up is really key. But I think even the American markets, you know, people will shut down and stop buying cars. I think, you know, especially in a, in a cash crunch, especially if there's no paid leave, right? Remember during the government shutdown? I live near D.C. Oh, my God. In this government shutdown, D.C. just became like this this total cash credit crunch because all these federal employees, all these government contractors had all their grants and contracts shut down. Um, and no one was being paid for like almost a month during the shutdown last year. And yeah. it was just it was abysmal. And the, just every the co- price of every commodity and business is just kind of froze. Restaurants just kind of like were hemorrhaging money. And I think that could happen if there's this workplace slowdown and like huge quarantines and lockdowns. So what? So okay. So let's say there's a best case scenario, which there might might not be. I mean, I think the worst case <laughs> scenario is economic collapse and and you know one percent you know deaths of the number infected, but hopefully as low as zero point two percent, and the infection rate is not as high as yeah. we think. But um, what's a what's a best case scenario that you see happening? Best case scenario is that um, we get a miracle vaccine that right now maybe it's faster than even the one year world record. Um, maybe the seasonality really slows down and, and by summer it kind of like dwindles away. And by the time it comes back again, we'll have antiviral drugs ready, assuming no drug shortages. Uh, vaccines close behind and um, and basically good testing that reveals that again really fast forward like really forward you know good proactive testing that finds cases early before they hit um, brew and uh, too fast and I think maybe we could just escape with the hair on our chin 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 that barely we <coughs> escape um, a recession. But I think a potential recession is if I were to be a betting man on the market and uh, I don't have that much assets uh, that's in the stock market, I would um, I would convert things to cash or maybe crypto. I don't know. So, but I don't even know how crypto is going to react to this. I, I personally feel like um, just, you know, there's too much volatility or or in ter- alternatively, Invest in uh, volatility, you know, interest rate uh, yeah. swaps or something. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I mean, this has been a lot of valuable information. I think the main thing is uh, the the testing to see what the true fatality yeah. rate is. We don't know. We don't. We're going to know, gonna know a lot more soon. Yeah, and then we'll we'll also know if this somehow dies down, like in a seasonal way, and it gives us a, a breathing room. 
Well, if you get the disease now, and and there's no cure, and you just see initial symptoms, does something like Tylenol or ibuprofen work to handle the inflammation? Um, for the infection, I'm not sure because viral infections are very tricky. You can alleviate some symptoms, but um, you know, if you take some cold medicine, but I'm not sure if it will actually. I, I, it's viral infections are very different from bacterial infections, and so I think there is no home remedy per se. I would rather people go get tested um, than try to hunker it out, especially especially hunkering it out at home or just hunkering it out at going to a waitressing job and potentially spreading to like hundreds of people on the job. I think that is much riskier, and this is why we need to support free testing for people. Um, and it's actually a very bipartisan issue, uh, Democrats or Republican independents. So I, there's no real home remedy. I would just right now focus on testing, testing, and then, you know, wait it out and see how much, how bad this epidemic is. I would love to have a follow-up <laughs> um, interview in the near, near future because we're literally at the cusp of finding out so much more. We just yeah. un- unlocked the testing two days ago, finally, after getting permission for FDA and CDC allowing all these state labs to run it, and boom, we're getting this huge wave of epidemic. And I think by next week, we'll find more. Find more what? Find more cases in many different states. Right, so so cases, not necessarily people dying, but but because we're, because the testing is more available, we'll be able to see how many more people actually have this, but we, we didn't realize it before. Yeah, exactly. I think it's already here. It's already here. We just, we're just literally driving in the dark without any headlights. Right, and so, so, so I guess that's the, the so, you, so, a, yes, let's definitely update in a, in a, in a few weeks, because I think, I think the main thing right now is that how many things we just don't know, and the media yeah. craves to know, and it's that kind of conflict yeah. that is creating a exactly. lot of this panic. It, and, it is, uh, mm-hmm. but at the same time, the fact that the first few cases there was already a death, that means it's already been there. It's already been there. We're, we're seeing like a rewind. We're seeing. It's kind of like. And light is, reaches us from other galaxies. We're seeing as it was three weeks ago, not as right. it is actually where it is now. And that's the danger. Um, but I, meantime, I think people should stop sh- shaking hands. People should yeah. fist bump. Stop yeah. touching elevator buttons and doorknobs with your fingers. Try to use a paper towel or use the back of your hand. Um, just social distancing. I think it's the best safe thing right now. I, I, I like that myself. I, I And I hate the bro hug when people when people get together. <laughs> And like the people are doing the foot tap right now. It's funny. Or right. the elbow bumps. Um, yeah, I like the elbow bump. I'm, I'm going to stick with that from now on. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but yes, I will. Uh, so Dr. Eric Ding, and you're at D-R-E-R-I-C, D-I-N-G on Twitter. You, I, yeah, I, Dr. I Eric Ding on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Eric Ding on Twitter. I noticed um, you're providing a lot of updates there. I encourage people yeah. to, to check it out. It's very valuable information. And... Hopefully in a few weeks we'll have some some idea of which direction this is going because I think the the entire world, not just in terms of um, illness, but in terms of the economy, is kind of I I feel there's a a two to five week window where we need to kind of start getting some answers. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, well, thank crossed. you so much. I, I really you. appreciate you responding. I just want to mention on this podcast, I I texted you like a few minutes before I called you, and then and I'm so happy you were available to talk. This is, it's yeah. been great. Well, it's, it's important. So um, fingers crossed, and I uh, hope to talk soon. Okay, talk to you soon. Thank you, doctor. Bye-bye. Bye.